All right, so uh, you guys helped me a lot this morning, so today, now I'm gonna try to return the favor and add as much value as I can. So I've sold in dozens of markets and niches on Amazon, and you see a lot of common themes and the same strategies and principles that work in one tend to work across all of them. So right now I shall <laughs> try to make it look better than this. There we go. All right, so just quick background. Um, I started selling on Amazon five years ago. Uh, I started a pet products brand. Um, whoops, pet product brand and a baby brand. And I built that up with my team and built up the systems and ended up selling that company last year. And meanwhile, I was running uh, my Amazon agency. I started that as well three plus years ago. Um, and now we're up to a team of over 15 people. And from that point, uh, we've sold in lots of different niches and uh, we help manage the Amazon sales channel for companies and try to help them as much as possible, take it off of their plate. Um, anyways, enough about me, let's get into some strategies that'll help. So first, um, it's always good to review the blocking and tackling the fundamentals. Um, even if you're selling millions of dollars a year, um, sometimes the simplest things we'll actually miss and we'll overlook. So before you start getting too crazy with advanced strategies or investing you know, tons of money into PPC or Facebook ads, before you start looking into adding new products and focusing on the next shiny object, go back to the basics of you know, all of your products. Do you know what their conversion rate is t today or this last month? Maybe it was good six months ago, but is it good today? Sometimes stuff will happen on your listing, not even just your sales copy, but bad reviews, seller feedback, unanswered questions. Those things can really hurt your conversion rate and you may not know it unless you're actually uh, checking that on a regular basis or have, you know, even better, have one of your team members check it. So if your conversion rate is 5% or something along those lines, like you need to fix that first before doing anything crazy. Like that's what you need to do. Um, what I do without even asking her is my mom looks at a lot of uh, our clients listings and she tells me exactly what is wrong with our listings. So um, she's very good at that. She'll be like, Jeff, what, what, there's, did you see this review that happened two weeks ago? And I'm like, no, I haven't seen that one yet. And, and she's like, well, it's a bad one. You know, it's on the front page. I'm like, really? And I'm like, well, I think we're fixing that. And then I check it and we didn't fix it. And then we fix it. And then we plug the hole and make sure that we have a system going forward to make sure that any you know, reviews that are popping up, seller feedback, there's softwares out there that can manage that. So my mom has helped me a lot with that. You can ask my mom as well if you need. Um, and then you know, we'll talk about images, sales copy, reviews, but you know, those are the big factors that affect your conversion. Now, one of the biggest things that we really spend a lot of time on before we write sales copy, before we do anything crazy, whenever we take on a new client, is we actually look at their competitors. Um, your competitors, you know, you may even have some competitors in this room, right? Everyone in your niche, they've done all the homework, so don't start from scratch. Don't reinvent the wheel. Um, so we spend a lot of time looking at our top competitors, our top 20 listings on page one and even page two. Uh, you want to look at their reviews. You want to read their positive reviews and their negative reviews. Um, you can learn so much from that. And you want to find the pain points that customers have with their products so that you can you know, illustrate that in your product why you solve their pain points. Um, also, it changes regularly uh, what your competitors are doing. So you don't just do this one time. Do it every six months, every three months. Just do a quick review. You know, what are they doing in their images, in their sales copy? Do they have video on their listings now? Um, you can learn so much and what you want to do is, um, you know, see what they're doing well and do it better than them or, or do it similarly to them and make sure that you're not missing out on anything. Um, we're starting to see people offer a lot of different free bonuses and value adds right now, whether it's an ebook or an audio file, a guided meditation, you know, depending on your niche, there's so many things you can do to differentiate. Um, and so that's where we start before we write the sales copy. Once we have all the great things and the negative things from our competitors, then we go build that into our clients' pages, and you can do the exact same thing on your own. Um, next, um, you know, again, basic stuff, but make sure you're using the title, uh, the full character limit, every niche is different. Make sure you're using that. That is where Amazon puts the most weight for keyword optimization is in the title. So really make sure uh, that you're not wasting space there. Um, 
again, it's basic stuff, but like, you might be surprised. Like, check your competitors' images. Ask your friends to look at it and say, hey, how, how do my images compare to these other guys on the page? You might be surprised how much better there are than yours. And you know, sometimes a $500 photo shoot can literally lead to $100,000 or more. Um, it, that's what helped save my pet products business. Our competitor just had way better images. He had invested in, in just one photo shoot and he just looked like a premium product. And so, you know, sometimes we overlook those things and sometimes it's, it's just good to invest in that and you can use that on social media, um, you know, Amazon, Shopify, everywhere. It's worth investing in and make sure you have top of the line. All right, so just a couple basic examples of sales copy. Ryan talks about a lot. Don't just talk about the futures of your product, but talk about the benefits to the customer. What are they getting? What emotions are they gonna have when they have your product? What problem are you solving? Um, really connect with your buyer. And you do that in the sales copy, in the images, in the title. Um, make sure that that's consistent. And again, this isn't rocket science. You've heard it before, split testing, but are you guys actually doing it? Like when was the last time you actually ran a split test, right? Um, you need to have a, a system in place where at least periodically, once every quarter or once every six months at a minimum, just test something to improve. If you can improve your conversion rate from just for round numbers 10% to 13%, well, I'm not a mathematician, but I think that's 30% growth in your entire sales, right? And so it can be that simple with one little fix. So, you know, split test these different things and it doesn't need to be fancy. You don't need to use the software. You can just split test it for a week or a month and um, you know, you can split test your price, sometimes the easiest way, just as uh, the, the lady who, who kept raising her price on her swimwear today, she raised it from 20 to 40 to 60 to over 100 bucks, and she, all she does is sell out of her stuff. So, um, you know, test that stuff. Okay, so now we're getting into a little bit more, always be thinking of new growth strategies. So, um, are you using Amazon pay-per-click ads uh, efficiently? Um, are you reviewing them? Is there someone on your team that's reviewing them? Uh, you can make a lot of money with Amazon ads and you can lose a lot of money with Amazon ads. Um, are you using the new headline search ads that came out? I'm sure you guys have seen that pop up. Make sure that you guys are doing that. It's incredibly effective right now. Um, review strategies. Make sure you have a number of review strategies that systematically and automatically are building reviews at a faster rate than your competitors. Get creative, do research, um, and make sure you have those things in place for all of your products. Um, marketing inserts, those still work. Um, you know, you can get real creative with what you put on those marketing inserts, what you want them to do. Um, you know, make sure, like, that is one of the best investments you can make. Sometimes it costs 30 cents to put a marketing insert into your packaging, especially if you can have it done in China. There's a company called, uh, I think, Printed Online in China.com, and like, it costs, I think, five cents per postcard, color postcard, double-sided, five cents. Um, to have that printed and the factory will often put it in for free. So five cents, you can get an offer that can get their email, can you know, do lots of fancy stuff with that once you get them to your website. Next, um, you know, there's a ton of Amazon promotional things that they've added recently. Um, Amazon giveaways is one where you can give away, uh, have you guys seen this before, the, the Amazon giveaways where you can drive people to a YouTube link and have them watch a video to enter a giveaway and it's through Amazon. Amazon is letting us do this and so take advantage of that. We're seeing that you can get, if you set it up the right way, you can get, th in order for them to enter, you could say I'm gonna get, you know, they have to watch a full YouTube video or a Vimeo video, whatever you want, or like your post on Twitter or retweet it. And when, you, when they enter it, you can say, I'm gonna give away two products for every 3,000 people that enter into the giveaway. So you get 3,000 people to watch a YouTube sales video for your product, and you give away two products, right? And then there's a way you can do it where if they lose the giveaway, which you know 2,998 people will lose the giveaway, they get an automatic email from Amazon that you can give them a coupon code. Say, hey, sorry you, you didn't win, but here's 20% off of all of our products. Um, and we're seeing like great conversion from that. So those ROI things that Amazon's helping us come out with, you just gotta take advantage of them. Coupon clippings has been good as well. That's where uh, people can clip it and you're showing up in different sections of Amazon where the coupon shoppers are going and they're clipping coupons. Um, so make sure you're using that. It's different than the normal promotional code that shows up. 
Um, Prime Day is coming up. Uh, it's easy to overlook that. Um, I don't think they've announced a date, but it's probably going to be July 10th to July 12th. So make sure you're stocked up for that. Uh, last thing you want to do is run out of inventory. Um, book lightning deals if you can, if you're still eligible right now. I think they're closing it today or tomorrow, I believe. Um, so make sure that you're booked up there. Uh, run promotions on Prime Day. The traffic is going to be probably, you know, I don't know. I forget what, what it was last year, but typically we see a four to eight times uh, our normal daily sales average just in that single day. Um, so make sure you're ready for that. Um, who wants to pull their customers off of Amazon and control them and be able to sell to them on their Shopify store later? I'm sure everybody does. Um, hopefully most of you already know this, but just wanted to throw it out there in case you're not doing it. You are able to download the Amazon customer list and you take that customer list and you upload it to Facebook. Facebook, we're seeing match rates of around 50 to 70% because they have enough data from Amazon, even though they don't have their email, they're getting incredible match rates. So one, you can directly retarget your customers um, and drive them to your Shopify site if you, if you don't want to send them back to Amazon, that's fine. Um, so you can directly retarget to them. And then if you're not doing it, definitely create lookalike audiences off of that audience. So if you have 10,000 customers, create a lookalike off of that. Amazon, or sorry, Facebook can go find 2 million people that, that have similar attributes to those same folks. Um, and even better, get your repeat customers, your best customers, your best of the best, make it look like off of print, look like audiences, because um, those are your best customers. All right, next. Um, I love Amazon, but even I know too, because I, I sold my business last year, do not just rely on Amazon. Do not only do Amazon. I don't recommend that to anybody. Um, everyone in this room is doing the right things from the sounds of it. You know, you're focused on Shopify, you're, you're focused on building an audience, you're focused on getting into retail. Um, all those things are gonna increase the value of your business and create a uh, more sustainable business, uh, less risk in your business. So continue to focus on that. Okay, so real quick, I just wanted to take uh, a minute um, to share my experience with when I sold my business, um, help you. It took me nine months to sell my business. Um, and had I done it over again, had I, you know, could redo it, um, knowing the lessons I, I knew today, uh, I would certainly be able to make more money and uh, sell it a lot faster. So, um, every, and I know there's already been a presentation on this, so I'll, I'll fly through it, but a couple of these points haven't been mentioned and it might help you guys out when you get ready to sell. Number one is have your books cleaned up. Um, all my books were in Microsoft Excel. I built my own profit and loss statement. Um, probably would have got an F uh, at Cal Poly for that. So definitely make sure you don't build your own profit and loss statement unless you know what you're doing. Um, hire an actual accountant that gets your books up to date. Um, use a good broker that you feel comfortable with. Interview a couple of them uh, at least and make sure that you actually get a good feeling that they're gonna show up and, and help you through it. Um, one thing that I learned was keep the lawyers out of it in the beginning. We got uh, the, the buyers of my biz, uh, business, they wanted their attorney from day one involved in the negotiations when we were just negotiating the high level bullet points of the, of the, of the business structure and the price and the, you know, how long would I stay on and all that. And it dragged out and dragged out because it was redlining documents, redlining documents. We paid thousands of dollars to lawyers and basically almost lost the deal because of it. So just try to you know, keep it just one page, bullet point document, deal with directly with the buyers first. And then once you get to that final phase where you're drawing up the asset purchase agreement or whatever agreement type you're going with, then it's, I would say definitely get a lawyer involved, but try to keep them out until like that final phase. Um, and another lesson I learned, you know, I thought, I thought that we were going to sell and close in 45 days. Um, I know some people have said that they've done that. I didn't have that good fortune. So what I did is I took my foot off the gas of the business a little bit because I thought that we were going to sell super fast. But lo and behold, it took nine months. Uh, Chinese New Year came around, didn't plan for the inventory, ran out of stock of our best seller. Sales dipped. Buyers almost pulled out. Um, we had to negotiate a bit and I lost, you know, 10 or 15% of the purchase price because of that. So I would say run the bit, even if you're selling it and you're on market, act as if it's gonna take you two years to sell your business because you wanna be selling it on the way up. You want no red flags as you're going through that process. 
Um, SBA loans, I've already talked about that. There's pros and cons to it. Um, it can really draw out the process. It takes a lot longer. Um, in hindsight, from where I was at, I wanted to sell quickly. I probably would, if I could get a cash deal versus an SBA loan, I probably would have taken a five to 8% discount off the top just, just to close it within 45 days. That would have been worth it versus wasting nine months of my time. So something to consider depending on where you're at. But if you got the time, then SBA is a great way for, the, for buyers to get a lot of money for cheap. Um, another quick lesson is um, require a non-refundable deposit. If you're gonna enter into like an official LOI or, or asset purchase agreement, Make sure that the buyer is serious. You, you will get a lot of looky-loo buyers that literally will put, like we heard on stage, right? We got people that talked with you know, 150 companies, put out a bunch of offers. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. That's just how it works, right? Um, and so you don't wanna take your business off the market and have a buyer that, that's gonna go into an asset purchase agreement um, without any non-refundable deposit of some sort. Uh, that happened with me. We didn't have them do that. Um, they offered $10,000 over asking price. I'm like, oh, sweet. That's, you know, done deal. Um, going to close really quick. They dragged it out for two months in due diligence. Then they started asking the real questions. Then they got through the financials. Then they got all that stuff after we had already taken it off of the market in a holding phase. And because of that, the buyers backed out. I lost all the momentum of the sale of my business. We had a bunch of buyers before and they all went away because I took it off the market for that guy. So, um, you know, depending on the sale of your business, maybe like a two to 5% non-refundable deposit. Um, I would say at least $5,000. Um, and if they're not ready to do that, if they say, I'm not putting on a non-refundable deposit, all you gotta do is say, okay, well then ask me all your due diligence, due diligence questions right now before we go enter into the asset purchase agreement. Um, and that's what I did the second time around. That worked a lot better. And also as you go through due diligence, if they have that deposit down that they can't get back, they're gonna be serious and they're gonna wanna finish. And that's what did get us to the finish line. Um, another tactic is um, definitely try to create a feeding frenzy when you launch uh, your business for sale. Uh, you're just gonna have a lot more leverage if you have you know, five or 10 or 15 interested buyers. Don't just try to talk with one and then try to do the negotiation. Um, it's supply and demand. If you, if you are in control and you have multiple buyers, they can't negotiate the price down much because you've got five offers on the table. Um, that's how I started out and I had a lot of leverage and then I lost it once all my buyers, uh, once I chose one buyer that backed out. So definitely try to create that feeding frenzy. Um, and uh, on this point, consider negotiating a limited consulting contract. Now, make sure you consult your attorney, and I'm not an attorney or anything, but um, depending on the deal that you're doing, uh, there's a high chance that you're not going to be paying, um, that they're not going to pay you 100% of the purchase price right away, right? You don't, you don't get 100% of it at closing. You're probably going to have a seller promissory note something along those lines. So you might not get 20 or 30% of the rest of the purchase price for maybe five years over time. And so um, you already have that vested interest to have the buyers be successful. And one way I was able to get my multiple up from three to four times was that I basically negotiated a side consulting deal where I just, you know, I said, hey, um, you know, I'll, I'll stay on just in one to two hours a month max every single month for the next two years. So two hours of my time. And that, you know, we were able to negotiate a small royalty on all sales in the business. And, you know, and I'm happy to help them over time over the next couple of years because they still owe me a lot of money. And I wanna make sure that they're successful. I wanna make sure that they have the cash flow two years from now to continue paying me the money that is still due. Um, and so it was a no brainer for me just to add on a couple hours a month, I would do it you know, anyways for them. Um, and so just know that there's other levers that you can pull that can increase your total cash flow in multiple. Um, have systems, I'm gonna talk about this on the next slide, but if you can show the buyers of your business how easy it will be for them to take over, they're gonna be that much more likely to wanna to go through with the deal. If your business is a mess and it's all run through you and it's all in your head, 
and they're going to find that out quickly, then they're going to pull out and do diligence or at some point. So show them your documented system, show them how easy it will be to transition the business to them, um, and they're going to feel a lot more comfortable. Um, and then, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. We covered them all. Okay, so I talked a little bit about systems. So, um, and uh, some other speakers this weekend have, have done a great job talking about it, so I won't spend too much time. But again, to do a sellable business or any business, you, you need systems in your business so that your team can be helping you um, to run the business. So here's some of the ones that we use. We use Kartra, it's a CRM. Asana is a great project management software. Basecamp is a similar one. We use that for our clients, actually. That's how we communicate with them. ClickFunnels is great. Uh, Slack is great. Zoom and Loom, they're video recording softwares and video conferencing. Um, you know, it's good to have good sound technology and invest in them. They're usually 10 to, you know, 50 bucks a month. Uh, but it can really make a difference in your business. Last points on systems. Um, so running a business on Amazon, you know, e even if Amazon is taking up a lot of your time, the way that you fix that is by building systems around it. And that's what we do at our, our company, but you can do it in your own company as well. That's how I did it. Um, so before you can be successful on Amazon, you gotta have a plan and you need to have the manpower to execute the plan. Um, like I said, we have over 15 team members and that's why we rely on systems so that I can keep track of everybody on the team and that's how we manage hundreds of products on Amazon. Um, now again, like I wish I had some silver bullet to tell you guys today of how to win the long game in Amazon, but there's no silver bullet that I found. Um, you have to do a lot of things right every single month. Some things are every single day, every single week on Amazon, and that's the only way to win the long game. And if you don't have the systems in place to do everything that we talked about today, like some of them may seem a little bit basic, but are you guys actually doing them in your business? Like, are you doing them on a periodic basis? Um, but so if you can build those things in place where your team is executing those things and you have the fundamentals down and the advanced stuff, then your business is going to grow month after month. And then again, systems, if you can set that up and set up your Amazon systems the right way and have all those dialed in, that will free you up like everyone's talking about. They want to focus off of Amazon. They want to focus on Shopify, on building the audience, on production, on launching new products. So. The only way to do that that I know is you got to systemize Amazon and uh, take that off of your plate, put good people in place, whether it's in-house or whatever you want to do, have good people that are capable of running those systems. So that's it. If you want the slides, I didn't print them ahead of time, so you can email me at jeff at turnkeyproductmanagement.com. Um, and again, if you have any questions at all about Amazon or strategies, I love talking about that stuff and I'm happy to uh, help the fellow backroom members, so feel free to shoot me an email. And that's it. Um, happy to do Q&A if we have time or if we gotta run, we run. Mike. You had, you had an example before of a, a listing that had like a, a lot of bullet points with a lot of copy in it versus mm -hmm. one that was like really simplified and basic to the point you pointed out all the benefits. Mm -hmm. What differences in conversions do you see um, between the two types of bullet points? And mm -hmm. does that outweigh the benefit of not having all the keywords in a stuffed bullet point, like the one on the left? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it depends on how good your sales copy. You want to keep it as, as concise as possible. You don't want, you know, five paragraph essay, you know, that showing up there. So one thing that we do is, you know, and you guys have all seen it, the, you know, the all caps for your short punch, you know, the short benefit, and then, you know, stack some keywords. But you're really all, always trying to make it as readable as possible and the best sales copy that you can do. That's the best real estate. Um, so we do err on the side of using almost all of the character space, um, but not trying to just be a keyword stuffer purpose. That's not why we do that. It's to, you know, try to sell the product and the benefits um, in there. I mean, and from clients that have just like five words to going to the paragraph uh, portion with the, you know, converting to the benefits and the why, uh, we've seen between, uh, you know, it'll jump from 10% to 15%, 10% to 13%. Uh, it depends, um, but certainly you can see a significant jump uh, depending on how weak it is and how strong you make it. Hey. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about what you're seeing different 
preferences in mobile versus desktop? And like if you're running split tests, how are you optimizing kind of for both? Like how do you ride that line? Yeah, mobile is is becoming a much larger focus now for us and you know we now mainly focus on making sure that it's readable in mobile um, tested on different devices as well like for example seeing where the title cuts off you know sometimes the title will be cut off on mobile and it'll have the little three dot ellipsis right well <laughs> sometimes it's in the worst possible spot where it's not a good ending last couple of words you know so you may want to just simply rearrange it so we're actually making sure that it looks great on mobile because we know on most desktops, you know, it's going to show up the whole thing. So we really try to optimize for mobile uh, first, and that's that's how we build them. Uh, what about what about bullet points? Because I noticed on mobile, that's not the first thing you see after title and image. Yeah, yeah, you want to check how readable it is there and make sure that it's coming across well. Do you, but do you sense that they're even relevant, like? Do people go that deep into the listing? Like on mobile, the, the bullets are right. kind of more varying. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, they're not as impactful as far as mobile goes, but, you know, we're still going to optimize them because there's going to be the desktop users that will do it. So, um, so you just try to influence and make optimization changes for what does impact at some point. Images, title, bullets, those are the big three. And enhanced brand content, if you can get a trademark and get... Um, a plus content that really helps as well. Matthew. For, for the, uh, the truncations and the ellipses that get put, and you know, you know it's not never checked, but I'm just curious that is it different across not only devices, but different um, like iOS, Android, it's different screen size and iPads, like different screen size, the Mac has a 13 inch thing, which might change the, the website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's a great question, um, and I, I believe, I'm pretty sure that it does. Um, and so we definitely test the iPhone first. The that, iPhone, yeah. yeah, that I would optimize for that first, and then if you can, you know, pick a you know a Galaxy or and a and an iPad as well. Um, and yeah, it's great if you can perfectly line up different ellipses. That that's awesome if you can do that. Um, but definitely, I would start with the iPhone. Well, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Yeah.